Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, today we are going to do a getting started with Linux Mint video. So this is for the new person who is just looking at different Linux options. Now, I did a previous one on MX Linux. Hopefully this one is a little bit more refined. We're working on the process on this. But uh, what we want to do here is we want to talk about getting Linux Mint installed. We're going to do the installation and then we're going to do the first setups before you get into it. Now, before we do this, Linux Mint is my favorite Linux distribution. It has a good balance of everything's working out of the box and it is easy to use and it is familiar. Now, this is where some, there is certainly some, um, we shall say, uh, personal preferences in the computing world. Some people have said that younger people, particularly who've grown up on tablets and cell phones, they operating system like or a desktop like gnome might make more intuitive sense but for those of us that grew up on old school computers and learned productivity in that method that's why i like the cinnamon desktop better and linux mint is the group who has created it so we're going to walk through the installation and then once it is installed we're going to talk about how to update it we're going to talk about uh, adding and removing software, we're going to look at the uh, system notices and things like that. So let's go ahead and get started in here with the installation process. So as we start installing Linux Mint, and uh, I'm doing this in a virtual machine, so there's going to be a few little things that, that you won't be able to see. One of those is going to be your um, effects, so the cinnamon effects, the snazzy, you know, cute up and down windows, those are not going to work in my virtual machine. The other factor that's not going to work, uh, well, what, what we're going to see is we're going to see a notice about software rendering up in the corner pop up several times. That's perfectly fine. So we're going to start by walking through the installer. Just click that open and then we're going to install the multimedia codex because installing the multimedia codex is going to allow us to play music, videos, and things. Just make sure that it is legal to do that where you are. Most places it will be. You can choose if you want to install alongside what you already have or if you want to erase the disk. And if you do select the erase disk and advanced features, you can use LVM, uh, logical volume management, and you can also encrypt the drive if you like. There's something else that we haven't looked at here. This will allow you to manually partition your drive and do things. So we're going to go ahead and choose what we're going to do for our installation. <clears throat> we're going to start by selecting your time zone. I'm going to switch everything back to New York because of my channel's Eastern, even though I'm not in the Eastern time zone right now. So we're going to enter in our name and our information. So here's our password. It's definitely not one, two, three. And then once we go ahead and walk through that process, it's going to spend uh, anywhere, depending on your system, between as little as five minutes and up to like 20, 25 minutes to get everything set up and installed. So what we're going to do here is we'll be right back when the, this is done installing. Now at the very end, you have the option to continue testing or simply restart now. I usually, just out of habit, I hit the continue testing, shut it down, and then remove the, the um, virtual disk. Or if you're doing this on real hardware, remove your USB drive, CD drive at that point in time. You can hit the restart button and, and uh, it'll prompt you to do that on the virtual machine. And um, I think it might actually prompt you on the real hardware as well. It's I install more Linux distributions virtually than I do anywhere else. So once it is installed, we're going to go ahead and boot the system up. And once we get the system all booted up, the, our next step is going to be... The, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, change our... Uh, we're going to change our packages to be pulling from a more local region to where we are. And you can change these anytime. If you go to run a software update and it's like, can't find repository, scary messages all over, just go into the software sources like we're going to do here momentarily and just change them. Uh, it's possible that the route to wherever you are getting your repository is just down for whatever reason. So we're going to go ahead and boot in. We'll land on our uh, land on our login window. We'll go ahead and get it logged in. There's that notice about checking your video drivers, and then we are greeted with this welcome screen. 
Now, I don't want to see this welcome screen every time, so you can turn off that dialog box, but this also loads as a startup application. So if you remove it from the startup application window, and we're going to do that at the very, very end of this video, remove it from the startup applications, it won't start either way, even if it says don't show it. And it's advisable to take it off in that startup applications because right now it's starting, it's just not showing, and that means more system resources. So inside the welcome screen under our first steps, we can choose our accent colors. Uh, we can choose a light theme and a dark theme. And then we can go with a more traditional, older, like a Windows XP type approach. Or we can go with a modern, more Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10 type approach. There's system snapshots. Now, for me, I don't waste my time with system snapshots. I know I am very um, controversial in this. We're going to go ahead and talk about system snapshots in a little bit and why I don't. Uh, but right now we're going to move, skip that one for now because that's going to show up in our um, system notices. We're going to look at our driver manager now. So I click the driver manager. It's scanning to see if there's anything extra. Depending on your system, like on a virtual system, it might prompt me to install guest editions for VirtualBox. You're not going to see that if you're doing it on a real hardware. What you might see is, hey, you have a weird... Um, graphics card. You have a weird wireless card. We found drivers for it. Not too uncommon. That's going to patch up anything else that's not already embedded in the kernel. And this brings us over to the update manager. So clicking on, on the update manager, we do have a blue option up there to change our local mirrors. This is the part I was talking about earlier. The repositories is where your Linux software comes from. And there are places all around the world where you can do this and this option in here will actually go in and it will select it will show you how fast each of these are going now here in the united states i usually just stay on linux mint for the first one which is the linux mint specific software just because it usually rates itself up pretty high the only option that I do differently is I don't like downloading my repositories from companies. I don't know why, I just don't. I usually grab mine from either some official repository uh, from the distribution or I tend to grab it on something like, um, I'll grab it from a, a university. So here we're looking at the Ubuntu ones. You can see where, where we're at. Now this is especially interesting because I'm traveling in my van around the country and so if I need to push an update it's very easy for me to go in here and change it to whatever's fastest that day. Now once you change those there's an option down there at the bottom to refresh the cache. This is going to refresh your list of currently available packages to install. Now in Linux some people talk about oh the terminals scary. It's really not. You should learn how to use it. You can run update everything in the terminal and it actually runs a little bit faster. But Linux Mint has the software manager in such a way that you don't have to uh, you don't have to bother doing that. You can see the little shield in the lower uh, right of the screen there. Um, the dot indicates that there is an update to be done. So here we're just looking at the different software source options and Usually, before you push system updates, there sometimes is an update to the manager itself. Always apply those. It's going to download its package, update itself, and then it's going to refresh on the system and show you all of the packages available to upgrade. Now, upgrading, again, can take anywhere from you know just a small amount of time you know a few minutes with a really good processor and uh and no uh you know a very small list of packages in this case this is distribution is a few months old now so there is our substantial amount of updates that we need to do and so we're just going to go ahead and uh, click our buttons there for um updating the software and then once the manager is done you can see that it has a lot more packages and so what we're doing is we're just going to hit the select all and apply all these now if i'm updating a computer that um if i already have a computer that's well established i'm not always going to push up install everything every single time uh, I'm going to see if there's anything in there that I might want to specifically hold back. Like Firefox versions, I sometimes hold back a few versions because of the weird things Firefox tends to do from time to time. All right, now that our updates are done, you can see the, the shield icon notification is gone. So the 
the square with the exclamation part next to that is our system reports. This is or system error, system notices is what I tend to call it. The first one is a language pack. Who cares? It's like, hey, you want to download a thousand other languages? Well, no. <laughs> Ignore that one. Next one is your system, your system snapshots. Now, this is the part that's controversial. For me, reinstalling a Linux distribution takes less time than messing around with the snapshots. Okay, it, it's like when you write several pages of an essay and then you hit a wrong key and delete it, and you spend five times more time than you wrote it, and it takes to rewrite it to try and restore what you had. I know it's a part of human nature where we just love to get in here and do this. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not a fan of system snapshots. I think they take too many, too much time, too many resources, and installing a Linux distribution takes like 20 minutes. Uh, it's not worth my time. Now, I can understand the person who does, and, and hey, no qualms about it. I don't care. I think it's, it's a very good tool. I'd rather it's here and we not need it than it not be here at all but that personally is my take so with that how do we use the system snapshots well as far as if your system's not booting and uh, if your system's not booting and you have a system snapshot and you know how to install that I don't know look up online I don't use these things okay but let's go ahead and talk about how to create a snapshot and, and by the way I'll, I'll just say that that if there is a problem, Linux Mint might very well prompt you to do that. It's going to be a very simple step to restore from your snapshots. But let's go ahead and walk through the process of, uh, of creating the snapshots. So as soon as you open Time Shift, or in this case, we're just going to hit the Launch Time Shift button from the System Report screen, what it's going to do here is it's going to first ask us what type of snapshot do we want. Do we want an R-Sync or, um, you know, or are there other options there? Just use the R-Sync unless you have a specific reason or knowledge to use the other option. What it's gonna do is it's estimating the size of the file system. Since I'm using just a 25 gigabyte virtual disk on my virtual machine, the amount of free space versus the amount of space a snapshot's gonna take is gonna be a little bit tight. So just keep that in mind. So what we have here is um, it's giving us the different options and the sizes what's free and what's used. You can choose what type of snapshots. So in this case, we're keeping five daily snapshots. And then um, I think it's keeping like one a week and then we're keeping five of those. And then here we're deciding, are we going to keep all of our uh, home folders? Um, and then you can do all files, exclude all files, or just do the hidden files. And there's some other things you can do in there as well. Hit the button and it's going to start the process and then you will have snapshots. Over on the system, back to the system reports, on system information is just a lot of information. So if you happen to have a bug in your system and uh, the bug in the system, you're like, hey, I don't know what to do. And you're seeking help forms. People are like, tell me what your system is. And you're like, I don't know. Uh, pull up that report, hit that button, copy that, paste it into the answer. That is everything the computer geek is going to need to know about your system to help you diagnose the problem. There's the third option there, which allows you to upload it to Pastebin. So if somebody's like, give us a Pastebin, like, I don't even know what that is. Just hit the button. It's going to give you a link and you can paste that into the form you're seeking help. These are all excellent tools to use. So now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what is in the menu. We're going to talk about installing and uninstalling. Since I don't use things like Redshift, um, I'm just going to use this to show you how to uninstall something. Right click it from the menu, uninstall, done. You can do it through the software sources as well, but I find that this is easier. Uh, and we'll get into installing packages in a moment. We're just removing a few things right here. You can actually move things around. I have separate videos on that. It hasn't changed in forever. So it's just a right click on your menu icon, configure the menu, and then do it advanced options. I have another video on that. I'll card that one here. And so coming in here, what you might want to do though is you might want to adjust how things are set up on your panel. Now again, Linux Mint makes this easy. You can right click and add things to the panel and then it will just appear down there. You can also right click and add things to the favorites. In the same way, uh, here you can add something to the desktop as well. And there's the panel items. So what you're gonna do to remove them from your favorites, that's that uh, light gray portion on the side, you can hit remove from favorites and you'll see that Firefox has vanished. 
So here, I, I can never remember where this thing is, so it's called Nemo. Let's just find it there, right click, and remove from favorites. But let's go ahead and add a few things to favorites that we might want to use, like transmission. Maybe we're doing some, some torrents there or something. So now you can add transmission to that. I don't need uh, the terminal on both the favorites and on the panel since I use it more frequently. I'm going to keep it on the panel and not in the favorites. But let's go ahead and add LibreOffice to that there. Now, also, let's say I don't want Rhythmbox on the desktop. Well, that's easy enough. We can just go ahead and delete it from there. And uh, we can also drag from the menu down into the panel. All right, so the next step we're going to look at here is let's move some things around. Under your panel edit mode, you can you can't uh, you can move around the whole block of icons, but you can't move the individual icons there. You can do that when panel mode is turned off. We'll show you that in a moment. But panel edit mode allows you to adjust the height of the panel. It gives you font size, color icon sizes, and things on each of the zones. The three zones of the left zone, the center zone, and the right zone. Left zone is the solid red, center zone is the green, and the right zone is the uh, purpley. It looks kind of like Ubuntu over there on the right. And um, so you can go ahead and auto hide the panel. You can always show the panel or you can intelligently hide it. That's another matter of personal preference. I always show mine, but that's the way I like to run. Next thing we're going to do here, let's just go ahead and grab the icons and drag them around a little bit. Now that last one there, that's actually the desktop icon. So, oops, turn panel mode back on. We're going to drag that, and I like throwing it down there in the right-hand corner. Throw the mouse to the bottom, click the button, and you'll always show your desktop. Turn the panel edit mode off, and now I will be able to drag and drop around my different icons. All right, so now we're going to start uh, looking at some software manager. So it's going to take just a moment to update the cache. So we're just going to leave that aside for a second, and we'll have a look at our system settings at the same time. So inside your system settings, obviously your background is easy. Linux Mint has always had some of the best backgrounds there were. So you can go ahead and uh, just see what these guys look like. They're all beautiful. Just pick the ones that you would like to use and uh, go from there. We'll go ahead and take the countryside, select that. You can also go up there into your pictures and anything's in your pictures, or you can hit the plus down here and add any custom folder on your computer and then see a listing of all photos in there. The effects, this is the part that's not going to work on the virtual desktop. But what you can do here is you can choose what your different items are, and then you can choose how they actually orientate themselves and the timing and things like that. But you'll see, even though I have the effect styles turned on, even if I go ahead and minimize, maximize, things are just disappearing and reappearing instantly rather than using effects. That's simply because the way my system, my test system here is set up. So we'll not worry about that too much. So next, having a look at your system themes, you have a lot of different themes to choose from. Linux Mint maybe in some ways gives you too many, but under the Add Remove, you can go online and download some more. So just find one that you might want to use and hit the download button. So let's see, we'll take uh, this dark theme here. And if you scroll down to the bottom, we actually have a Windows 10 light theme. Let's go ahead and take those two themes with us. So once those guys are installed, Go ahead and hit your themes and then head on down to your desktop. Looks like the um, it does give us uh, the different um, the different elements. So you can see here a Windows 10 buttons, but there's no icons. They did not give us Windows 10 icons. I'm a little saucy about that. They are available. Um, you can go online and download them. So just be aware of that. Oh, let's hit the Windows 10 window decorations as well. There we are, now we have a Windows 10 looking computer there. I am still a bit saucy, they don't have the Windows icons as well. They are available, you can download them and install them. And let's go ahead and have a look at the other one that we downloaded. See, there's the Adara Black. And uh, I didn't see um, uh, window controls with that, so we'll just go ahead and use the, the dark ones there as, as much as we can. So there we can change our whole theming fairly simple as well. Other system settings in here, just a variety of different um, applications. Here's the startup applications I talked about. This Mint Welcome, I always turn that off. 
And uh, if you're not going to print, turn off your print cues. If you don't have an NVIDIA card, turn that off. I personally turn off system reports. I don't care. I can diagnose my own problems. You might want to leave those on in case if something goes goofy. You can call all those applications. That's just things that will start automatically. Um, also in here, your preferred applications. You can choose what different types of applications load with automatically when you click. And you can also go up to the top under the removable media. And every time you put in a individual item, you can set what it does by default. What does it open with? What does it do? And does it prompt you or not? So that's what we have. Um, the only other thing I'll draw your attention to in here right now is actually going to be your firewall. I personally keep the firewall turned off if I'm in uh, on most of my computers because my network has a very good firewall. For my portable computer that goes around with me connecting to internet, I do use the firewall option here. We're not going to cover how to use it, but just be aware of the firewalls there, but it is disabled by default. Why is it disabled? Well, of course it's disabled to um, prevent you from having a lot of hassle and problems with things that should be working but aren't. All right, so now looking at our software manager, we do have flat packs and regular repository software in here. So either one of these options are, are going to be good. And um, I personally go with repository first, unless there's a very specific reason to use a flat pack. So in this case here, looking at Caden Live, they don't give us a lot of the, the details, like what version of things are. That's something the Linux Mint Store does not get right. Most other software managers will tell you the versions of the software. But um, we do have the, um, we do have the um, flat pack and the repository versions. So KeePass XC, um, well, this is KeePass X. Um, I should do KeePass XC, actually. That's what I generally use. Um, we're just going to go ahead and install this just to show you how you install something. Just click on it. It's going to prompt you for your um, password. Enter that, and then you will be pretty much set to go. So there is your getting started with Linux Mint. Hopefully this has been helpful for you to figure out how to get started. And hopefully it will also help encourage you down the road to try out Linux. Get away from all of the, uh, all of the Windows and the Mac and the spyware and all the other stuff, the Chromebooks and whatever else. Move to something where you do truly have control over your system. It's not as complicated as some people think that it may be. With that, guys, thanks for watching and hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash t-o-m-m or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.